for our awesome two speakers right on. Woo Thank you. I did not write that introduction. I don't know who did it. <laughs> it would have been only half of what happened. But I want to thank everyone here for allowing us to be part of your afternoon. After sitting here this morning and part of this afternoon, listening to some of the speakers, you know, it's something that we're all, we don't realize that we're all in the same boat. We all want the same thing. We're all awesome people. As I, I was very fortunate, I was one of the ones that was born and raised by traditional grandparents. So therefore my Salish language was my first language. A lot of our tribal members never had that same, same opportunity as some people like like me. A lot of other people lost their language at a hard time because they were never taught their language because of the various reasons by the federal government and other agencies that tried to take that language away from us. But those of us that grew up in, with our language are very fortunate. We don't realize it, how fortunate we are until we get to a a point or, or a gathering like this and, and realize how how important we, and how lucky we are that we still have our language. You know, we all come from great leaders in this nation. We all came from people who were, were strong, who were, who were fighters, and who were willing to do anything to make our lives the way it is today. And without those ancestors that did, we would not be here today. They never gave up. And that's why today a lot of our elders always say that never give up. No matter what it is, never give up. As uh, what you have is something that needs to be passed on to the next generation. Whether it's just one person, at least you're passing it on. So I, I hear from what I hear this morning, there's a lot of good work going on. There's a lot of things that we need to understand that we need to come together as a people and, and start some sort of uh, programs or something that we need to move forward. We can't look back into some of the things, bad things that took place. We need to look forward and, and work hard on what we need to do to make sure that our children, our grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and all of those yet to come have the same opportunity as we did when we were growing up. So we need some, some sort of movement to support uh, those future generations so that we can continue to exist as Native people in this world. So those are some of the things that I think is important that we all understand that, you know, we all went through the same thing in, in various ways. Uh, the hardships, uh, the loss of our language, the, the, the racism, which is still going on. We, as Indian people, somebody mentioned this morning that it was tough being a Native person. And it is, because we have to get up every morning and we have to prove to the dominant society that we exist, that we have a right, and that this is where we belong as Native people. So, over the years, for the past 41 years, I've been very fortunate to work with traditional elders in my program. When it first started in 1975, I, I was, it was only uh, uh, Four months old when the, when the program was only four months old when I had the opportunity to come on board and start working there. These are some of the elders, first elders, what I call elders council that I started out with. We have an elders council that we we, we meet regularly with uh, from from uh, October through June, and then I let them off for the summer for the powwow season and kind of gather them all back up in the fall. 
And this one here is, is what we have, and we have the current existing elders committee. When I first, when our program first started, we had, I had over 20 elders that I was able to work with. And now it's dwindled down to probably 12, 13 active members. And they're all getting up there in age. And so it's, it's, it's kind of fight against time uh, to get their stories, get their information, make sure that everything we get from them that they know we have. Right now we probably have uh, 1,400 hours of, of, of audio, of information, starting back from when the program first started in 1975. And those audios are what we're working on today, uh, educating our young people. So a lot of that work, that the information we collect, we translate. The first 300 or 300 or 350 hours of audio that we collected were all done in the language. So we had to go back and translate those, those uh, tapes into English so that we could start teaching a lot of our children and understanding a little more of them. But now we're back, we do bilingual. We, we translate the Salish part and then we have the English next to it to compare and all the material we done. The Elders Committee plays a, a kind of like a, a, a sounding board for us. Everything that we do as a culture committee, we go through their elders to make sure it's accurate and correct before it goes out into the public. It, it, there's a lot of things that the elders say, no, those things need to stay within the tribal system, within our people, so then we keep those. But they let us know what, what can we share with the general public for education. So they, they play an important role in what we do. Uh, so, like I said, for 41 years I've had that opportunity. We've collected, we've collected stories, we've collected photographs, uh, we've collected uh, many different things from them to make sure that what we have uh, is going to go back out in, into the general public. A lot of the elders that we have today are, are a lot of, most of them now are bi bilingual. The first group we had, a lot of them just strictly stayed in the language. So we have the bilingual today, which helps a lot in many ways to, 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 uh, uh, in, in explaining some of the things that we're doing. We do a lot of things, not only the language, but we, we do out, we go through the work. Uh, there's a lot of demand for our program in, in Aboriginal territories, especially or for sites, sacred sites. Uh, educating people about the importance of the, the native people that were here first in this country. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do that a lot of the dominant society hasn't even realized or hadn't heard about. So right now there's three languages, there's three confederated Salish and the Kootenai tribes. The confederacy, the confederate the tribe, the Salish tribes, consist of mostly the Salish and the what the, what the people are calling Pondere, which is a French word. But we call them the Kajispe, the Kalispe. So it's the, the Salish, Kajispe, and then the third one is the Kootenai. The Kootenai, uh, there are seven bands of Kootenai. There are five in, still in Canada, one in northern Idaho, and one on our reservation. The Kootenays are from the Tobacco Plains area, and then through the, as I, this one band kept, came further and further south, and eventually when the Treaty of 1855 with the United States government was signed, that band of Kootenay became part of us uh, on the reservation. The other two bands, the Salish, at one time the Salish, the Salish, were mostly in the southern part of what is now Montana. The what we refer to, what, what you see here, uh, is the Kadispe, the Kalispe, existed in the northern part of what is now Montana, and their relatives further west, the lower Kalispells in, in eastern Washington. So that whole area there is one speaking.
serious people. According to our elder stories that we've collected over the years, that the Salish people were one large group before it got too large, that they had to spread out and spread out and, and find more resources to feed the families. So that's how you become the other Western Salish speaking people, the Kalispells, the Lower Kalispell, the Cordelines, the Spokane, Shushrub, Calva, all of those, the, according to the elders, came from one group at one time. So the northwest part of what is now the United States is where the Salish-speaking people exist from Idaho, Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and the, I think the, the Thompson Salish in, the, in uh, Canada. We are the most eastern Salish-speaking people, and that's a, a brief history of who we are as, uh, as Salish people. And our language has been a big role, a very important part all through the years. And our elders continue to push us to teach the language because our language is not only our connection or, or the, the identity of who we are, but all of our ceremonies, all of our songs, all of our, everything that we do is in a language. And so all of our people uh, should learn the language in order to get the full benefit of everything we need in the language, especially in our ceremonies. You know, our elders have always said that even though that a lot of our language is lost, we need to hang on to that language. That is our existence. This morning you heard someone mention that the government is always looking for ways to do away with tribal people. And language to me is one of the biggest foundations that we have, that, that the main foundation of who we are as, as Native people. Without that, our foundation would be very weak. That foundation, our stories, has more meaning and explains more in our language. And like I said, our ceremonies, everything that we do in our language makes us that much stronger, no matter who we are and where we come from. And listening this morning to some of the people, you know, we are on the same boat. We all need to, to find ways to support each other. We need to find ways to, to look to how we can help the future generation become stronger in their language and continue to exist as Native people. Without that, our existence is in jeopardy. As we look at the, at the federal government today, they're always, like I said, finding ways to do away with who we are, the first people of this nation. We have been ignored. We have been uh, more or less uh, uh, a backdrop for the dominant society. Whenever they need something that's going to make them look good, they bring us out, show us off. We're doing this for the Native people. And then when they're done with us, they put us back on the shelf until the next time. We have not been truly recognized as Native people to this country. We have truly never been put at the same table as the other people in this country. So our language becomes very important because that, to me, is our foundation for our future generations. And with that, I want to turn the mic over to Cheney. And Cheney's going to tell you how we're going to do that. Right? Thank you. I'm Jamie Bell. I work at the Salish Pottery Culture Committee as the language coordinator. And first, <laughs> I didn't say no that this money isn't helping us. I said I hope. And I, and I think of that from, from uh, 
our value system that when we say hope, it's because we pray, we've been through our ceremonies, and we're working hard for, for these things to come true. So I hope that what we're doing is working, but we still have to work hard, and we've got to still do our prayers. So, Tony, you know, we've all seen how tough this is. We, we know our history of where we've come from, all the historical trauma that our people have faced. And we're at this point, and we're aware. We're aware of what needs to happen, that our languages are going, the dominant society is, is, is winning. The things that they put in place to destroy us is still happening. It's still happening right now. We're speaking English, we're living in their culture, in the dominant society. But we're aware of this and we're doing what we can to reverse that. It's time to reverse and we want our people to be, to know who they are, their identity, and to live in this world. We always talk about living in two worlds and I've been telling kids on my reservation that it probably goes against what a lot of people say, but we don't live in two worlds. We live in one world and I'm scared you no matter where I go. I, I tell my children that all the time that you're always scared. And so, but we're still struggling. And our reservation, we're down to 26 fluent speakers out of about 8,000 tribal members. Out of the 26, there's probably about nine that are actively involved. And maybe out of that nine, there's about three that are actively involved every day. So we're struggling with the Salish, Salish Kadiska language. And the Kutni, who is a different language, you know, they're even in worse shape than we are. I don't think they have a representative here, but they're struggling too. We're all struggling, but you know, so since the 70s, when T Tony and them started the culture committee, they worked hard. And I would never say anything wrong to the work that anybody's done, because all the work that we've done in the past has got us to this point. And so I'm thankful for that. But we never, we have not created a new fluent speaker. Nobody in their home has passed it on. None of these programs that we've created have created fluent speakers. And so about, 14 years ago, there was four of us who we were young, full of energy, and we seen this issue. And we listened to the Maoris, we listened to Daryl Kim, we traveled all over, and we, we heard the message to start a language school. So we started one. We went to the elders committee, we asked them to come with us to try the council. We came in there with about 40 people and said we want to start a school, and they gave us some money. It was that easy, seriously. We, we went and prayed, we, and we went in a good way. But what wasn't easy is when we opened the doors. Daryl Kipp never told us how hard it was going to be. It's very, very hard to run an immersion school, especially if you don't have young, fluent speakers. So he, Daryl said, put some elders with some little kids, and magic will happen. And, and it is. It's magical to see this interaction with our kids and elders. But we were putting all of this, all of this on our elders to bring back our language. And they're, they're older and they, they can't sit there with the kids all day and they, it's not their job. That's not, at that age, that's not what they should be doing. So it took us about eight years to really realize that we were struggling. We were, you know, we had ups and downs, really good times. Kids were learning learning some awesome cultural things, and getting a, a foundation in our language, but not really becoming fluent like we were hoping. So we sat back and we assessed our situation. And then, pretty obvious, you have to have young adult fluent speakers that understand what needs to happen. That they, they, are, they want to be a teacher, that they want to they know they want to pass this language on. And the number one that you know, we really want to see is that they want to pass it along in their home. So with that, we, 
just like a lot of other tribes, we've struggled trying to find ways to teach adults. So we looked all over. We tried a lot of different methods, TPR, TPRS, direct acquisition. We had people come in and try to sell us the best language techniques, the best way to make CDs. You name it, we've seen it. And we put a lot of money into things that did not work. Then again, they, they helped in certain ways and they gave young kids important things that they needed in their life, but we did not create fluent speakers. And that's our goal, to keep our language alive, to talk it again in our homes, and our ceremonies. So we met this guy, his name was Chris Parkin. He's a non-Indian guy, married to an Indian from Colville Reservation in Washington. He's a Spanish teacher, or he was a Spanish teacher. And his wife, you know, they raised their family, and his wife said, I want to learn my language. And she tried to learn a language, and she went through the same thing a lot of us went through. She just struggled for a couple of years with a word list and just couldn't learn. And she asked her husband, I'm struggling. I don't, I don't understand why I cannot speak my language. You know, and he said, well, you know, let me, let's go to class. Let me go to class with you again. This is the short story for one day. He went to class, and his basic answer was, you guys are doing it wrong. He's created all these fluent speakers in high school with Spanish kids. They go to Mexico every year, and they can get by, and they can talk in the language. And he said, you guys are doing it wrong. It's that simple. So they stopped everything, they dedicated their lives to his wife's language, and they created a curriculum model that he gives away free. And I'm not here to sell that curriculum. He doesn't sell it, he, he would say, he could care less if anybody uses it, except the people he want, you know, he's teaching. He didn't create it to make a name for himself. He created it to save his wife's language. But he said, if you want to use it, go ahead, here. And there's teaching, there's teaching methods, there's, it's a whole array of things that go into this curriculum. And his message is always, you got to find something. If you get to this point where you don't have fluent speakers, crows, you're ahead of the game. You still got a lot of fluent speakers. Don't let that pass. If you get to where we are, that's where this curriculum steps in. It's for people at my level that are kind of intermediate and I can teach it with the help of fluent speakers. I don't put the burden on their shoulders. I, I take that burden with their help. So when we get to the Montana Indian Language Project, the first one we, so I got it, I'll go back a little bit. We got an ANA grant, we implemented this, this curriculum for three years. Then the MILP came out, and I did eight more students for nine months, put them through this program. Second year, they changed the rules in the MILP that I could only hire a certain percentage of people with that money, so I couldn't do the adult language program, so I really had to think about what I wanted to spend that money on. And I think this would be my message, is when you do something with money and with your language, it needs to be, have a, have a point, I guess, a, a purpose. You can't be so random that in 20 years, you're looking back and you don't have enough fluent speakers. You really gotta sit down and think about how you're gonna do this. And it can be a strategic, strategic plan, but it could just be with some friends, and you say, we're gonna start an immersion school. Or you, whatever it is, there's a lot of answers out there, but you got to really focus. You have to focus because this is really, really hard work, and we all know that. So with me, with us, we have this curriculum model. It takes you from here to here in one year, and we always say after one year, you're not fluent, but you're ready to begin learning. Now you're ready. You've got the foundation to start talking with fluent speakers. So we put them through this one year intensive. So I have this money. I couldn't do the adult program. So I said, what, what can I do to, to support what's going on? Can I support the 
Harlem Language School? Can I support this adult language program? Can I support what's going on in the public schools? And for me, it's the adult language program that's key for us, for our tribe right now, is this adult language program. And so this program consists of This is kind of an outline of our adult language program. Just, it takes about one, one year to 15 months to go through it. Starts at a level one, level two, level three. In level one, and it's not based on a book, so, but there are books with it. It's based on three things, or four things. Quality language materials, elder and student immersion, repetition and view, and you have to shut off English. At some point, we usually do it right in the middle, at book two, no more English. You just, you don't allow it in your classroom. So, with this money, I said, how can I support this program? So I went to book one, and book one has a CD, it has a book, it has all the teaching methods, all the pictures, everything you need to teach it. Um, has an online program that you can use. But one thing I keep, kept hearing in my community is, we need an app. I kept hearing that. Then the Crow app comes out and everybody keeps showing me, look at this Crow app, it's so awesome. And I said, well, I'm not just gonna create an app that's just put all this money into something that, you know, I could be teaching someone the language instead of creating an app. So I. If I'm going to do an app, it really needs to make sense. It really has to have a purpose. So we created an app with the mind, with the thought that it's going to support what we're doing. So when a student goes through this curriculum, the language app supports that. And, and so the app that we have, this first book has 45 lessons, 10 vocab words, and four sentences per lesson. And that app contains all 45 lessons. It was pretty big, it's the biggest app they've done. We had to pay extra for it, but it was worth it to align it with what we're already doing. And that comes directly out of the MILP. Huge thing, it hasn't come out. On Friday he just emailed me, said he's working on the, um, the little button. But I have the rough draft. If anybody ever wants to look at it, they can look at the, I can show it to them. The Crow app is downloadable and it's real similar, except ours follows our curriculum model. But it does cost a lot of money and there are other, you know, you, if you want an app, I would say make sure it fits what you're doing so that it's not random. If you're teaching this in your classroom, you would want your app to follow that in some way. They're expensive and they take a lot of time. <clears throat> Um, another thing we worked on, we worked with uh, Native Teaching Aids. There, she's sitting right back here. Um, she's in St. Ignatius, and um, I met her through uh, Michael Framboy at uh, Blackfeet Community, and they did some awesome things on that first MILP money. And so we sat down and talked and talked about what could we work, what could we do, you know. And, same thing, I didn't want to do something, she has a lot of cool games. But I didn't want to put money into something that was just random. It needs to help our people right now, create fluent speakers right now. So, same thing, we created a game that supports book one. It looks like this, it's called Phrase, Phrase Builder. It has 45, all 45 lessons in it. Real fun game, um, by itself. You can still play it by itself, but it really works better within the teaching of this curriculum. Um, so those are the two things that support this curriculum that came out of this money. The adult language program. This is our app, the game. Also, I'm going to talk about this last. We're also doing 15 books. Um, these, this is going to support our language school. These are preschool level books. And again, we wanted to do something that supports what's going on right now. And our language school really needs Salish language 
reading material. Preschool, our school goes preschool through eighth grade, so they need all levels of language reading material. So within this grant, we did 15 books to support them, but they also support what's going on in the community and their own cultural stories and history stories. We're gonna be doing our strategic plan coming up. That's also under the MILP. We're hoping that it, that it helps with what we're doing. So, and this is just, you know, kind of what's under the MILP. We're doing a lot of other things in our community to bring our language back. It's about creating fluent speakers. That's our goal. Another thing that we've been talking about is the class seven language, Salish language certification. Um, we know there's been talk, you know, throughout the state about this. We have stepped our game up. Um, when this first started, it was for, we had fluent speakers that were teaching in a public school that were not getting paid at the same level as that they should have been paid at. For us now, we don't have no more fluent speakers that are going into classrooms. So this class seven, how for our tribe, how it was originally intended, doesn't quite work. We need to know when they come in if they're fluent or where they are in their language. So we really had to step up our testing and it really has changed the level of our language teachers. We used to have you know 20 or so language teachers. We only have two right now, two that are gonna take the test. So we've upped the test, it's pretty tough, but we need to know. Before we knew if they were fluent, you could tell if they were fluent. That didn't mean they were good teachers, but we knew they knew the language. Now, we need to know if they can teach it, we need to know if they know it. We, are, we really need to know, especially, this class seven is at, consider the same level as an elementary ed teacher. They go to school for four years to get a bachelor's degree. That's this same level. They should get paid the same level as that. So in, in my opinion, Dick Littlebear talks about this all the time. This is not, it's not a joke to get this class seven, or it shouldn't be. And we're taking that to heart that we, we want our class seven teachers to know what they're doing. So. I just wanted to share that and let you know that we stepped up our game in our class. We're trying to. We have more plans and making it better, but we also want to support the teachers and help them get there. That's what our curriculum is about. So that's kind of what we're doing. We're doing everything we can. So. school forced to learn English. My, my grandmother, my grandfather, my mom, they didn't speak English okay. And you're, you guys are setting standards. A lot of us don't know how to read and write in Navajo. Does that mean that we're not speakers because we don't know how to read and write in our language. You know, you have to take a look at that. And maybe some of your people might be fluent at this level, but because they don't know how to read and write, they, you're holding them down. You see, because in the old days, they didn't read and write. So why do we have to make the kids read and write. You know, that's, that's what I was going to comment on that. Thank you. Not, not much thanks. I know for our tribe, I can't speak for every tribe, but to mean that you're fluent has nothing to do with reading and writing. To be a Salish, cuddly spell language teacher, you do need to know how to read and write. It's two separate things. Fluency and being a language teacher are two different things. So. 
we do hold our teachers to a higher standard um, because we're asking them to pass it on in, a, in an official capacity. What somebody does in their home, that we we can't, you know, we want people to pass it on wherever they can, however they can. But as the official people that give out the class seven, we need to hold our teachers high standard, which means they need to be fluent, which we test for fluency. They have to talk and be able to express themselves in our language, but they also need to know how to write it, read it, for various reasons. Um, if, if a fluent speaker came in and wanted to be a teacher, we'll help them get there, though, so. The biggest fear that our elders have is that the dialect's going to change if we don't have people teaching the language correctly. And I've already seen that in the past 40 years, where, as I said, I started with the, all those elders who were very fluent and spoke in the language all the time. And their need and their fear that we were going to lose the language, they wanted our language to but over the years, we've had people not, that didn't come through the elders. They went out on their own and trying to teach the language without first coming through the elders and getting the, the, the correct way to say some of the words. That was because they had that fear that the dialects were going to change. Right now, as I said, the entire northwest part of the United States are saying they're speaking people. The nearest tribes, the, 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 us, the Salish, the Kalispell, the lower Kalispell, the Spokane, and some of the Coeur d'Alene, we can still communicate, we can still understand each other, but the further west you go, the dialects have changed so much that we can't understand each other. The language sounds the same, but that the dialects have changed. And that's one of the biggest fears that the elders have, is that they see already the dialects changing. Some of the elders say that a lot of our young people are not trying, get, are not learning the correct way and are, are, are getting lazy. So the correct way to say good is chest, chest. Now some of the young people that are teaching the language are saying, they're not saying chest, they're saying chest. They're a weaker chest, not a chest, the correct way, but chest. And a lot of those little things are starting to change. And that's the biggest fear of our elder, our, our speakers. So that's why we try to make sure that those that are speaking the language are, are put through this, this process that satisfies our elders. And just a little bit to add to that, we, there's a point in time when, when you're teaching a language and learning a language that you address that. At first, you got to be real careful when you're teaching language not to scare people away, push people away because you're hard on them about how they're talking. I've seen people turn their backs from learning because somebody's too hard. But we're conscious of that now that we want them to speak right. But you do that though. So in that curriculum, or you got to find the right time when you develop that relationship. When you're at a certain point, it's just like just with English, you would never overcorrect a little kid learning English, there's a point in time when you when you come in with that and teach them when to pronounce things correctly. And, and fluent speakers are a huge piece of that, so that they hear it correctly. And modeling is the best way, you know, not correcting, but modeling. And that's the best way to correct pr pronunciation. So, you know, that's, Pretty much all we have to add, uh, Lem Lunch Pesia, we're thankful for everybody that is here, and for the White Clay people and the Dakota for hosting this. 
I'd just like to close and say that, you know, we have so much to be thankful for as Native people here. Uh, there are so many people responsible for where we're at uh, with our language. Not only our fluent, speak fluent speaking elders, but all of those that work in the trenches on the other end with the non-Native people, trying to convince them the importance of, of our language. And, and I think that uh, uh, those that do that uh, are the ones that keep in, are, are helping us find ways and keeping ways to teach, continue to teach and keep things alive. So I think that Senator Winneboy has is, is played a big role in that in getting some of these things started and keeping going, uh, being relentless in, in trying to convince other politicians how important this is to the Native people. Our existence depends on our language and I think uh, Mr. Winneboy or Senator Winneboy had a big role in that. So. I just wanted to close with that and say thank you. Lemtem Spesia, to me, Hestrat, to Kurnetwa, to me, Nepiste, Nekesin Stowe, Lemtetik, as we stand to text good. I just want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I hope that someday, or that what work we're doing here today, and that someday, sometime down the road, when we see each other, We'll even know, even know more what you're actually doing. Thank you.